Hello, everyone on Zoom. <laughs> so it is a joy for me to be here in person and to be with you at home, in the car, wherever you are. Um, if you haven't been here for an in-person service in this hybrid situation, I encourage you to try it out. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty special. <laughs> And I want to thank everyone for supporting uh, the service today. Thank you, Matt, for doing, carrying so much of the load. Uh, whenever I do one of these and I'm speaking and doing some music, uh, I get so many balls juggling in the air, a few of them get dropped. So I appreciate all the help. <clears throat> I'm happy to help drop balls for you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so before I, uh, before I get started... Um, I want to share something by way of disclaimer, uh, the words of a bumper sticker that Debbie photographed yesterday while on the road and sent to me with the caption, good bumper sticker for Merlin. It read, my other vehicle is my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you know me. So I apologize in advance for any loose abstractions bouncing around in the back seat of my other vehicle. I will try to aim us back to the concrete and the practical. I want to start with a story about the time my older brother, Clifton, got rebaptized in the Jordan River in the Holy Land, 2018, when he was in his 70s. My brother, Clifton Snyder, is a poet and a writer. That's how he liked to be identified. Poet and author, it says on the gravestone he had designed. Clifton died while on vacation touring the Acropolis in Athens, Greece, October 24 of last year. Sudden heart failure. It was, it was a shock, and it was... Uh, not totally unexpected because in some ways he was winding down, ever aware of his own mortality and aware of his life product. He's a, he was a scholar of Victorian British literature and specialized in union literary interpretation. His personal and professional life was devoted to making sure people in his LGBTQ community, so long invisible, in our society were seen and had their rights respected. He found writers like Christopher Isherwood with whom he became friends. W.H. Auden, E.M. Forster, Oscar Wilde, Virginia Woolf, Walt Whitman. He was a founder of studies in, of queer studies at Cal State Long Beach and became a faculty advisor to the LGBTQ students organization. He published many books of poetry, novels, literary criticism. He was sober 43 years and found a supportive community and spiritual home in AA. Choose Love was the bumper sticker he kept on his dresser. Because love is love is love. The one on his refrigerator said, May all beings be filled with kindness and compassion for one another. So in 2018, now, for Christians, a visit to the Holy Land can be very significant. It's sort of like a, a Muslim traveling to Mecca or a Hindu to the Ganges River. I sort of tend to feel that every place is sacred, if you look closely, as the poet Elizabeth, Elizabeth Barrett Browning said, Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit round and pluck blackberries. <laughs> I think Clifton felt this way too, but he loved to travel and something drew him to the Holy Land. So, at the Jordan River, he's traveling with his tr sober travel group, and word gets around that a woman Methodist minister is going to baptize someone in the Jordan River, 
And also, anyone that wanted to reaffirm their uh, baptism could be baptized. So Clifton told me he did this. And he, came, he told me in, uh, one day at our house, shortly after the trip, and I was a little surprised because uh, while Clifton was a deeply spiritual person and found a uh, connection with his higher power through his community and found God through his union studies. He hadn't really been in a church since he was a teenager, except to visit. But I took his story, and then after he passed, I went back. I, Clifton was a man of letters. He left over 100 journals from the time he was 10 years old. Uh, and I got to share this. From that 10-year-old diary, uh, he writes about Merlin, his four-year-old little brother, and he says, Merlin is kissing everyone and loves everyone. <laughs> God, I wish that were true. <laughs> the, second, the second part, thank you very much. Truth or dare? Okay, so... So I read in his journal about this trip. He said something drew him, and he got in the water, and the minister asked him, do you uh, confirm your uh, commitment to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? And he was taken aback. He said, I didn't expect this. <laughs> I said, yes, for now. <laughs> So, and I want to return to this a little bit later. Uh, in our family, faith and love predominated. The unconditional love was most expertly expressed by our mother and more reservedly by our father. We were a Bible-toting, Bible-believing family and church, in some ways guided by fundamentalism and in other ways reactive and resistant to it. But there was suspicion of other people in the world, other Christians, especially Catholics, <laughs> modernism, and the non-religious. No one was more sincere in his faith than Clifton as a child. He was a serious boy, a pious boy, who played the violin and was devoted to his mother. He was always the smartest one. In time, he grew further from the church, and we were told by our parents that Clifton had quote-unquote, intellectual problems. A few years ago, I asked Clifton about this. Was that why he left the church? Because he had intellectual problems? He said no. Well, that was part of it. But the main reason was that he was not accepted. There was no place in our church for a queer Pentecostal preacher's kid. Now, this is the accidental way that he came out to our parents. At 19, my brother had his first love affair with a boy that ended in heartbreak for him. He attempted suicide by pills. Dad was called to the hospital and learned the story, and Dad told Mom. So here's the next heartbreak. The only sermon Dad ever preached about against homosexuality was just after that event, Clifton told me. Imagine the hurt. Although I'm sure I was there because I was there every Sunday, I do not remember the sermon, which is telling in itself. When did you first learn homophobia? Most of us don't remember because it's the cultural water we drink from infancy. When did you first drink racist ideas? These are things the culture feeds us as children, and it just creeps in, and it takes conscious effort to draw out the implicit bias so we can stop listening to it and passing it on. This had to change. I was speaking with one of Clifton's friends, someone from the program, 
the same age as him. He told me that he came out to his parents when he was 17. And what was their reaction? I wanted to know, hoping for what? Maybe something a little happier? They threw me out of the house. I think so highly of my father for the wisdom and love and acceptance he showed me. It's hard for me to acknowledge this low point, let alone my own failures. Dad encouraged me to pursue higher education. He taught me to value science and its insights. But I do share it because in many ways it's the story of America. It's the story of our culture that we have to confront before we can change it. I do know that Dad struggled and he grew. Before he died, only at age 67, Dad told Clifton that he believed he was born gay. And within the last year of his life, he said that, at this stage of my life, I'm not going to judge anymore. I'm only going to love. I told this to my grown kids, and one of my sons, a school counselor, said, yeah, get there sooner. In the end, my brother forgave our father for this and his other shortcomings, noting, and I love the Marianne Williamson quote, uh, go back and look at it, what is the essence of it? Somebody read it for me. Anyway, uh, the only way to overcome hatred is to love. That's the way I paraphrased it. He understood that dad himself was raised by a very stern and emotionally distant preacher, father himself. So back at the Jordan River, I'm sure that what Clifton was affirming in his rebaptism was the unconditional love and non judgment of Jesus. What he was holding back from, I think was the tribalistic, culturally prejudiced, homophobic Christianity of his youth, presently alive and well in the world. Here in this welcoming congregation, we would like to think that we are past all that now, but we see that it isn't so. The ACLU reports that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people in America continue to face discrimination in their daily lives. While more states every year work to pass laws to protect LGBTQ people, we continue to see state legislatures advancing bills that target transgender people, limit local protections, and allow the use of religion to discriminate. In Florida right now, there's a bill passing through the state House and Senate that would prohibit discussion of gender issues and LGBTQ rights. When I was 14, my conservative, intellectually curious preacher father gave me the little book by J.B. Phillips called Your God is Too Small. Half of the book surveys a host of parochial images of the divine from resident policeman to grand old man, managing director, and then God in a box, where this or that denomination has seemed to have captured and tamed and trained to their own liking something that is really far too big to be forced into little man-made boxes with neat labels upon them. So at 14, I understood that whatever the divine reality is, it was the images in our heads that matters most in guiding our behavior. If you hold a picture of a God who sits in judgment, rewarding the righteous and protecting them from harm while punishing wrongdoers with disease and calamities, then you are bound to be disappointed. I think of the woman whose mother, a good and righteous person, if ever there was one, suffered and died of cancer before she could enjoy her old age. 
Why would God let mom suffer like that, she pleaded. If your center of value is a cosmic referee or judge, I say, then your God is too small. I told you about the painful part of my brother's coming of age, and there were many joyful parts, too. Well, it turns out that our God was too small. It turns out that our God had the same homophobic prejudice of our culture. One of my favorite courses in seminary was cultural anthropology with Professor Charles Kraft, who had been a missionary in northern Nigeria and be then became an anthropologist. He used to entertain us with stories from Africa and his own family to make his points. Culture, we learned, provides the models of reality that govern our perceptions, although we are unlikely to be aware of the influence of our culture upon us. The way we do and think just seems to be natural, or human nature. It's just natural to eat three meals a day, isn't it? It's only human nature for teenagers to rebel against their elders, isn't it? The answer to both questions is, of course, no. But we wouldn't know this if we hadn't been exposed to other cultures where it is considered just natural to eat one or two meals a day and where there is no pattern of teenage rebellion similar to that which we carefully teach our youth. Such is the benefit of cross-cultural perspective. Our views on gender and sexual orientation seem just natural to us. But then we learn of the respect paid to the two-spirit people, those non-binary people in some Native American cultures, and hopefully we're illuminated. Professor Kraft told us about his time in Nigeria when he hired a local man to work doing manual labor. He worked for a while and then he quit. Sometime later, he returned and asked for more work. So Kraft hired him again. Again, the worker got paid and quit. Sometime later, he came back looking for more work. So Chuck Kraft confronted him. Now, this is the third time you've come looking for work after quitting twice. What gives? The man said, the first time I needed a pair of pants. Then I needed a shirt. Now I need some shoes. So through cross-cultural perspective, the white American learned something about our set of values in our own culture regarding the meaning of work and its prejudices against another culture's values. Another time, uh, the professor attended a festivity at night where there was dancing and singing and music. He saw things he'd never seen before. The next day, he spoke with some of them, and he shared his concern. Last night, he said, I saw some of the women doing what appeared to be inappropriate sexual movements. And the men said, oh, no, those were just ordinary sexual movements. <laughs> But my favorite story from Chuck Kraft is this one about his son. The little boy was being put to bed, but he could not sleep. He was afraid of the dark. He was afraid of being alone, and he was crying. The parents tried several times to comfort him. Finally, they said, you're not alone. Jesus is with you. And the little boy said, but I need someone with skin. <laughs> remember this. Always remember this. I need someone with skin. But it's not just the habits of eating, whether you use a fork or chopsticks or your fingers that are culturally shaped. It's also the symbols and beliefs of our particular re religious toolkits. It was at that time that I became acutely aware of ethnocentrism and how it shaped my view of everyone and everything outside the circle of my belonging in which I was raised. I was headlong into a personal examination of what faith meant to me. The word faith has a variety of uses in English. Sometimes it's practically synonymous with religion, 
with its whole system of beliefs, rituals, symbols, and social organization. People talk about my faith, meaning their religion. Sometimes it refers to a creed or a set of doctrines or particular beliefs. Sometimes it means something akin to trust. The Latin words for fides and fiducia I find helpful. They come from the same root, and so they're related, but have different meanings. Fides are beliefs akin to knowledge or opinions that we hold that may change over time based on new information that we receive. Do you believe the earth is flat or round? How old is the earth? Is it 6,000 years old or 5 billion years? Do you believe in reincarnation, the virgin birth? Many of our beliefs are subject to testing against reason or science, and I think it's best to revise them, even your most dearly held religious beliefs, when new information warrants it. My view is that religious, that beliefs ought to be universal or aim toward universality. We all live in the same world. The laws of nature that apply in India also apply in Iceland. Water freezes at the same temperature in both Uganda and Ukraine. Gravity works for all apples everywhere in the world. The same tr holds true for spiritual truths, though the language and symbols we use will vary. Then there's fiducia, trust. To what or whom do you entrust the whole of your life? What gets you up in the morning and inclines you to think that life is worth living? This trust, rooted deeply in the core of our existence, isn't dependent on the particular beliefs which are always in flux as our understanding continues to evolve. It is not inconsistent with the intellect, but it goes beyond it to something wordless and remaining, sure and ever-changing in the quietness of now. So says the song. So then I migrated to graduate school at the School of Religion in, in the, at USC, and I discovered one of the great theological minds of the 20th century, H. Richard Niebuhr, and his book, Radical Monotheism, and Western culture. Niebuhr takes the terms polytheism, henotheism, and monotheism, and he strips them of their mythological dress. I know that's a lot of uh, multiple syllables in those words, but let me break it down. In place of the word God, he uses center of value, or the one beyond the many, as a sociological descriptor. Polytheism is our natural religion, for we each carry many centers of value which sees our loyalty. Henotheism is a sort of tribal religion. The Oxford English Dictionary defines it as the belief in one God as the deity of the individual family or tribe without asserting that it is the only God. <clears throat> you know, I'm trying to try, try to get past the academic Merlin and get back to practice here, but bear with me. In the history of religion, henotheism is viewed as a stepping stone between polytheism and monotheism. Now, the French sociologist Emil Durkheim noticed something very interesting, that in aboriginal cultures... The symbol for the tribe and the symbol for the deity were often the same. Think about that. So the society becomes identified with God or the center of value. And loyalty to the center of value trumps everything else. It puts the tribe in its interest above all, at all costs, above morality and truth above other tribes and other people. 
When a people's ultimate orientation is their society or nation or their political party, when it is their value center or cause, then the social mores can make anything right and anything wrong. You can make practical applications to our current society right now, I'll bet. In the modern world, henotheistic faith may appear as nationalism. And Niebuhr wrote during and right after World War II. And he cites the extremes of German national socialism, i.e. Nazism and Italian fascism. Nationalism shows its character as faith whenever national welfare or survival is regarded as the supreme end of life. Whenever right and wrong are made dependent on the sovereign will of the nation, which may be determined by the dictator or the party. Whenever religion or science or education and art are valued by the measure of their contribution to national existence. We live in a frightening time. Many of us thought that the days of totalitarian nationalism in Europe had become a thing of the past. Now we see it is not so. In the speech and actions of Vladimir Putin and his propaganda machine, truth and lies are but tools in service to the center of value, the Russian state, as he understands it. Life itself, the lives of civilians, children, are of no value in comparison to the goals and existence of the nation. This is bad faith. In America today, we recognize the tribal religious quality of our politics, where the success of the tribe outweighs all other considerations of right and wrong, truth and falsehood. Bad faith happens when a finite value blinds its adherence to the equal dignity and worth of those outside the group. <clears throat> when we choose cultural prejudice against people of other sexual orientations, gender, race, or nationality over human kindness and love. So what does Niebuhr say about radical monotheism? Instead of the word God, which is loaded with cultural baggage and therefore can be confusing, Niebuhr refers to being itself. As faith it is the assurance that because I am, I am valued. And because you are, you are beloved. And because whatever is has been, therefore it is worthy of love. It is the confidence that whatever is, is good. Radical indeed. Choose love. The value that you and I have is not in relation to any finite value center, whether it's a nation, a political party, a church, a denomination, any class or race, or any closed society. <clears throat> if your faith excludes some beings because they do not meet the criteria of membership in your group, then your faith is not radical enough. Your, your value center is too small to paraphrase J.B. Phillips. Yet we are always tempted to seize on a new local tribal deity, to make an idol, whether it's the Bible, a creed, an ideology, or a party. Maybe you have heard the expression, if you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. This is a paradoxical Zen koan. It comes from the ninth century Zen master, Lin Ji. I think what he means is Buddha nature is not something out there. It is within you. It's within everyone. So stop objectifying the idea of the Buddha and worshiping it as a god. Instead, find the Buddha within and practice loving kindness to everyone. What is good faith and what is bad faith? 
whatever opens your heart to other beings brings us closer in compassion and loving kindness is good faith, whatever the tradition or the dress of language and symbols that it wears. Whatever separates by way of ego and fear, leading to suspicion, greed, hate, prejudice, is bad faith. So, my topic is faith. The good, the bad. I could have said the ugly, but I said the daily. How to deepen your faith. I think there's uh, three clues I want to leave with you. And they roughly follow the three jewels of Buddhism. I'm not a Buddhist, and I'm not an expert, but I have been greatly helped by my reading of Buddhism, which tends me toward universal love and uh, faith. So the three jewels of Buddhism are the Dharma, the teaching, the Buddha, or your inner nature of wholeness, and the Sangha, the community. So one, continue reading and studying authors who reject henotheistic, tribalistic faith and who foster a holistic center of value. Two, set aside a time of spiritual practice for meditation or prayerful reflection. Do it every day. Experience your individual self as part of a greater whole. In this way, you can hold your beliefs, your opinions, loosely. You know, in archery, or in art, or any skill, the trick is to hold the instrument just tightly enough, but not too tight. If you don't hold it tight enough, you won't accomplish your goal. If you squeeze it too tightly, you won't succeed either. So hold your beliefs in your experience in life loosely enough that you can let go when you find you need to make a, you need to make a course correction. Meditation and <clears throat> uh, calmness enables you to hold your life and the impermanence of life loosely and enter a, a, a place of calm and wholeness. So three, find a community, perhaps this one, where you can nurture and be nurtured along your path. Because the spirit of life, as I'll call, as I'll call it, is not an abstraction, but it is present here and now. Find someone with skin or some ones that embody the love and the wholeness that you seek. Or as Reverend Tom Owen told, find people that are free-thinking mystics with hands. <laughs> Expand your center of value. Don't judge, only love. Get there sooner.